Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Asrar. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, very good, alhamdulillah. And uh, Sheikh Asrar, if I may ask, uh, what uh, brings you to Cape Town? So uh, initially, uh, the invitation was from the Jama'atul Murabitun, which is the the group of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi, rahimahullah, who in fact is uh, originally from Britain, but migrated to Cape Town and the link between myself and Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Sufi relates to uh, my annotations upon his work. So he had a work which is known as the Return of the Caliphate. He actually entitled the book Return of the Khilafah. He, he would utilize the Islamic Arabic terms. But in my edition, with the permission of the trustees of Sheikh Abdul Qadir uh, al-Sufi's uh, organization, I had the permission to r- render the title to return of the caliphate in order that the modern audience, they understand what is actually meant by khilafa because so many people, they wouldn't know what the term khilafa entails, but caliphate people are more familiar with. So when I annotated upon that work, the work was received well and people understood from that, that the works of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi, uh, who is who, whose English name is Ian Dallas, that his works are relevant to our current modern world problems and his works are very relatable. But my intention was to bring out those works for the modern generation, for people younger than myself, so they are able to access those works. The annotations, in fact, would uh, would expand upon some of the concepts that the Sheikh may mention, which, because he was very highly educated, he would perhaps expect the reader to know so many things but in our day and age with the inception of the smartphone age many young people are not so smart in terms of uh, historical information or geographical information geopolitics so an an explanation uh, an expanding upon the book was needed and then interestingly enough the sheikh had actually migrated here to Cape Town so Cape Town was significant for him, for he had options to move to Europe or to anywhere else in the world. The fact that he chose Cape Town ha- has various implications, and from amongst those e- implications are uh, Islam's solutions to economic problems, mm. Islam's solutions to the racial problem. So, for instance, in South Africa, we have here in South Africa, there are deep rooted racial, historical, uh, we would say, problems, as well as solutions that are needed. And those solutions are found within al-Islam, within the teachings of al-Islam, and are found within the Muslim community. So people here, Islam has been here for 300 years. Muslims from various uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds have integrated, and unlike any other community within South Africa, so you have a clear divide between blacks and whites and other racial groups. But when it comes to the Muslims, there is more social integration in the masajid. When you pray in the masjid, you will see black people. You will see people of a spectrum of colors and linguistical backgrounds. And that is because of Islam's uh, method of integrating all types of people. And then economic problems that South Africa, even post Nelson Mandela, the the gold of South Africa is still owned by people from the UK, for instance, where I have come from. So I was surprised to learn about Margaret Thatcher's son and the activities of her son here, while our British public is unaware of what, what devilish behavior British citizens may carry out abroad. So you have devilish foreign policy of course uh, within the United States and our country of Britain follows the foreign policy of the United States of America especially post 1945 post World War II but citizens of that country who may be from more affluent backgrounds still continue that exploitation of Africa that exploitation of Africa is not only limited to South Africa 
We see that exploitation, for instance, in Malawi. Malawi, one of the poorest countries in the world, but a very nice population of people, black Africans who are very pleasant, but that country is very exploited and people are placed in post-governmental posts in order to carry out that exploitation. So you may have a person of a darker skin tone, but he still carries out the directives of his paymasters, who are the bankers. The paymasters, who are the people who give out those loans, the IMF loans. Pakistan recently took another, perhaps the 14th loan of $7 billion dollars why is Pakistan under so much debt? They need to pay back the interest on those loans. And these are the type of things that Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi points out, not only in his book, The Return of the Caliphate. He has other works as well, which I am annotating upon. And uh, though that solution that he had given people, I believe, is not limited to the Murabitun, uh, the Sufi order. It's for all Muslims. So whatever background of Muslims, whether people belong to any school of thought, they need to know this for political activism and political action. Uh, uh, Sheikh, um, thank you for that. Um, we obviously know that Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi was a Sheikh of the Qadri Shadli uh, Darkawi branch uh, of the Tariqa. But many people are not aware. They only associate him with uh, Tasawf or Sufism. Um, and, and they see him as a uh, typical scholar, Rahimullah, Islamic scholar. Um, you've mentioned the political uh, works and the political teaching of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi. Can you unpack that for us? And a question, I suppose, linked to that would be, can you uh, t- uh, tell us about the relevance and importance of the political teaching specifically of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi Rahimullah. So uh, much of his teaching was based upon warning Muslims of exploitation and that exploitation was the exploitation of bankers, exploitation of uh, f- uh, financiers, of revolutions, financiers of governments. N- the world banking system is based primarily upon riba and riba as we know in al quran al kareem is prohibited allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns regarding riba alladhina ya'kuluna riba those who consume riba la yaqumun they do not stand up illa kama yaqumu alladhi yatakhabbatuhu ash-shaytan min al-mas except like the one who has been touched by shaytan by satan and some of the commentators they say that refers to an yawm al qiyamah on the day of judgment when they stand up uh, dizzy as if they have been uh, possessed by shaitan. So a riba is such a problem that you have corporate cities like London, these, one of the capitals of modern day banking. You have New York City. Those cities have the bankers and the, the corporations, the centers. So the, uh, the, the FTSE 100, for instance, which is based in London, is the 100 corporations or 101 corporations that operate from London City. So that makes London City and New York City and even Japan, these areas, the the base of all uh, capitalist activity. But where is the minerals coming from? Where are the resources coming from? They are coming from places like Cape Town. They are coming from South Africa. They are coming from Zimbabwe. They are coming from... Uh, parts of various parts of Africa, various parts of Asia. Why are the people here not benefiting from those uh, resources? Why do we have shanty towns here in Cape Town? There should be not a single shanty town in Cape Town. I come from Birmingham City. We do not have the resources that you have in South Africa, but in Birmingham we do not have shanty towns. No one lives uh, in a shanty town or a ghetto. Uh, we have uh, sewage systems, we have everything. Where is that? What is financing our cities? What is financing Western civilization? The, f- the finance is coming from the East or the South. So you have the high-tech North 
and below the equator you have the south which is Africa and these exploited regions of the world why are those uh, white citizens of the western world and non-white so you have the likes of Rishi Sunak brown skin Indian background but he is still a part of that exploitative system so the, the, now it's gone beyond skin color because you may have people with shades of different tones of skin but they are still a part of that uh, global system that exploits people and like for instance you have Ethiopians who joined the IDF mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. Palestine you have Ethiopians black people but they are joining IDF to persecute the Palestinians mm -hmm. so it's gone beyond the time of Nelson Mandela when it was apartheid uh, differentiation on based on skin color now it's gone into what we would say as Muslims kufr and uh, mm -hmm. iman which is a kufr system we need to realize that it's kufr uh, unbelief this is a system of unbelief and Islam has an organic method of wealth distribution which includes the distribution of zakat so zakatul amwal we all know what zakat is 2.5 percent or one fortieth of our wealth but for instance the natural minerals that are found in the Middle East oil being uh, one of the the most well-known one-fifth of the oil revenue should be distributed amongst the poor mm. because it falls under something known as a rikaz a rikaz is treasures that are found under the ground so the if there was a caliphate uh, on the manhaj al nabuwa caliphate khilafa on the prophetic methodology what the caliphate would have is that one-fifth of the oil revenue would be distributed amongst the poor at the bottom end of society at the bottom end of society so similarly South African gold 40% of the world's gold or whatever percentage but around that much is from South Africa why have the South Africans not been recipients of that gold these are the questions that we need to ask why is that gold not distributed amongst the citizens of uh, this country and those people who are living in these shanty towns why should anyone be living in a shanty town in a country which has so much minerals and resources except that is due to exploitation that the, this country is still being exploited and it's not only South Africa it's across the world uh, we have a global facade a global corruption that we observe today in the form of Benjamin Netanyahu for instance where he receives an aid package from the United States worth seven billion while there is a hurricane in the United States of America and American citizens are not beneficiaries of that loan uh, the American yes. citizens are not benefiting in any way mm. or form so these are the type of things that Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Sufi would point out of course I've expanded on that and what I would want from the younger generation is to pick up on these works mm. to open their minds and to see the world for what it is but also realize what the solution is the solution is found in Islam some of those solutions which are mentioned in his teachings is and of course it's the teachings of al-Islam is the abolition of riba that we cannot have exponential growth of uh, debt to the point that it becomes unreasonable it becomes uh, a fantasy to say that for instance the Americans will ever fulfill their debt ever pay off their debt it's numbers on a screen how can mm -hmm. you pay off so much interest uh, it, the actual term is usury how mm -hmm. can you pay off so much usury it's impossible except without exploitation mm -hmm. except without plundering of resources to the point that the world's uh, current climate crisis is based upon this type of capitalism it's uh, so many of these American politicians now bring up global uh, um, uh, the pollution and the, cl the climate change but they do not mention the backdrop of corporations plundering the earth to the point that it can cause uh, landslides it can cause uh, or the cutting down of the Amazonian rainforest mm. to the point that the lungs of the world are being cut down based upon interest-based usually based loans that the South Americans cannot pay and then you also look into taxation how 
those loans that are given by these bankers that will only number around 400 individuals that's the globally globally that's mm-hmm. the uh, the estimation given by Sheikh Abdul Qadir in one of his works in the work technique but these bankers they give out the loan and then the governments need to pay back that loan so what do they do they raise taxes mm-hmm. so all the taxation problems so i was listening to some of the taxation problems you have in south africa you had the taxi rights yes N- yes so uh, why are those rights happening those rights are happening because of the raising of taxes why are taxes being raised to pay off loans so you have not only the exploitation of the minerals of the country which are then not the profit is not redistributed amongst the needy and the poor you have the high interest rates and then you have taxation high mm-hmm. taxation which by the way that system of taxation is from great britain so in uh, britain uh, in the, in the past we had uh, in the mid- middle ages window tax mm-hmm. so if someone had an extra window they would need to pay taxes if uh, you have absurd type of taxations in the past Uh, Margaret Thatcher she even introduced bedroom tax which was if you have an extra bedroom you would have to pay tax we even have now currently in britain inheritance tax so if your uh, estate is worth more than 500000 pound and you die 40% of your estate would be taxed so the rich can get richer but the poor cannot get rich so you there's a, there's a threshold that you cannot pass without being heavily taxed and then that taxation en- enters what is known as the black uh, budget where does the black budget go it goes into the army it goes into foreign policy uh, the spy way that the Mossad is utilizing now uh, Britain America Germany and Germany has some guilt trip that they feel mm-hmm. a need to arm uh, Israel due to guilt over the holocaust that the black budget then finances world military and that's a fourth issue yes which is global tyranny that we observe today yes. so the tyranny that we're observing in palestine remember palestine is the nerve center of the world once you tamper with the nerve center it's very sensitive the nerve center and the nerve center of the world is palestine more specifically Jerusalem and currently Benjamin Netanyahu who has demonstrated that his policy overrides the policies of Joe Biden mm-hmm. overrides the policies of Europe so therefore making Netanyahu the most powerful man in the west remember these guys are westerners mm-hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu is not semitic at all racially speaking he is not semitic he would be counted as a european but uh, nevertheless they take advantage of what is known as antisemitism but he's actually polish so this man he would be the most powerful man in the west benjamin netanyahu uh, it's it's not with that reason that israel takes part in the eurovision song contest why is a middle that. eastern state taking part in the eurovision song contest so this military tyranny that we see in palestine now is linked to the banks it's linked to riba it's linked to taxation all of these things are interlinked and of course the solution is found in al islam mm-hmm. what is the solution very quickly the abolition of riba the abolition of most taxations with the exception of what is permitted which is zakat and the permissible types of taxations which in islam these type of taxations are stored in the baitul mal and then redistributed amongst the poor so the beneficiaries of the zakatul amwal and these permissible taxations are the poor people are uh, is not the government so taxation is not to fund government it's there to fund the poor real free trade is also a solution what does that mean opening up the borders for poor people to go across borders in order to trade not for corporations so real free trade mm-hmm. which is the open market which is uh, the souq of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the Salam market Allah the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam open uh, uh, markets with that taxation and then of course there are other solutions like the reintroduction of the gold dinar the gold currency now some people 
They attempt to say this leads to deflation or they say that there's not sufficient gold in the world in order to uh, maintain such a currency or a, in modern economies. They are correct if we say that the exponential fake numbers that we have on the computers that represent an unrealistic economy. Yes, it cannot maintain trillions of dollars worth of debt because there's not trillions worth of gold, but we need real economy. Real economy yes. represents, a real economy represents feeding a person, having clothing, having the essential needs, meaning every citizen having those essential needs. And yes, economies do face a crash. They do face a crash. So then when we go towards that alternative, there may even be a crash in society. <clears throat> but that crash is bad for whom? It's bad for those banking families. It's bad Absolutely. for the people at the top. It's not bad for the people mm. at the bottom because the people at the bottom, they need homes, they need clothing, they need food. And that there are sufficient resources in the world to provide that for everyone. Yeah. Something came to mind. Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi always said, Rahimullah, um, that in the in South Africa, you, you know, political freedom was attained. Uh, but now we are economically enslaved. I don't think that situation is unique to South Africans, but I think it is a, a I think it's something that we see increasing at a global level. Can you say something uh, about that? Yes, so uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi uh, not only pointed out this problem with uh, South African freedom, he also mentioned he made reference to the Intifada, which the first Intifada in Palestine occurred in 1987. And uh, my book on the Caliphate is referred to as Intellectual Intifada. But what Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi, he mentioned, was that if we have this type of Intifada and the leadership, the Palestinian leadership, in that case he was referring to the PLO, they lead the Palestinian people to bank loans, to being indebted to the IMF, uh, meaning after fighting for many years, Palestine achieves freedom. What does that freedom really mean if Palestine is just plugged in with the rest of the world in terms of taking interest-based or usury-based loans, being indebted to the world banks and paying the same paymasters, the same owners of the banks, the same people at the top, the Rothschilds of the world? the Rockefellers of the world, these type of people or banking uh, conglomerates, meaning the blood of the Palestinians would be wasted in that regard. So this global structure that we have in the form of the UN or organizations like NATO, these type of organizations, they do represent that power, that power which lies behind the scenes. Those same people who are profiteering from the Ukrainian war. So you have Zelensky in Ukraine and you have Benjamin Netanyahu in Palestine, uh, two warmongers that uh, purchase weapons from the same arms manufacturers, take the loans from the same bankers, perpetuate war in the East, in, in Russia, and in the Middle East, in Palestine. And when those nations attain any freedom, uh, they are reintroduced into, into the global banking system. So that is what has occurred in South Africa in terms of we may have the racial profiling finished, we may have the apartheid finished, that black people can go into shops as they please, they can go wherever they want, that type of freedom is found. But what is needed now is economic freedom. And that economic freedom is found through Islam. And some people may say, if it's found in Islam, there are two questions here which people ask. One is, they say that if it is found in Islam, then why are the Muslims themselves not free? That's the first question. And the second question they may have is that is not Islam just acts of worship and has no is in fact apolitical, it has no political relevance, no economical relevance and no social relevance. With regard to the first, the first question relates to what the Prophet وسلم, informed us with regard to the Ummah at the end of times. So, Shiratu Sa'a or eschatology 
relates to understanding the world today and where Muslims stand. How, why we are in the dire state that we are in was foretold by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he also informed us that Islam shall return because the return of the Caliphate entails that the Caliphate will return, uh, and this was foretold by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he said to Abdullah bin Hawala that the Caliphate shall return to Jerusalem because the Caliphate traditionally has transferred from city to city. So initially it was in Al-Madinah Al-Munawra, then it moved to Damascus, then it moved to Baghdad, and then the last capital of the Caliphate was what is known today as Istanbul or traditionally known as Constantinia, Constantinople. That was formally abolished in 1924 and really abolished in 1908 when the Sultan Abdul Hamid was forced to abdicate from the throne or 1909. Then ever since 1909 or 1924, the Caliphate has not returned. But the fifth place that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed us of that the Caliphate shall return to is the city of Jerusalem. And that is center stage today. So the center stage of the world today is the city of Jerusalem and the Caliphate shall return back to Jerusalem. And we are told in the end of times the Mahdi will also reintroduce gold. So the, the gold distribution is mentioned and the fighters from Khurasan are mentioned. So the Caliphate is returning and with it is returning the its Caliphate ala manhaj in Nabu and the prophetic way. But at the same time this doesn't negate political action in other places. So for instance when you had political action in Nigeria, the African Caliphate in the 1800s, you had different uh, uh, parts of the Muslim world where Muslim leaders led the way in restoring uh, the correct financial system, but not only the financial system, just to uh, notify the listeners that the longest verse in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya Yuhallatheena Amanu, إِذَا تَدَايَنْتُمْ بِدَيْنٍ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّمْ فَاكْتُبُوهُ To the end of the verse, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَيُعَلِّمْكُمُ اللَّهُ yeah, To the end of the verse. That verse, the longest verse in the Qur'an, is on trade. Mm. Trade and, so when you take a loan, or you need to pay someone, you take a debt, write down the debt. The point is that Islam is a deen of transaction. Not so, just Ibadah. Not just Ibadah. So all the traders in Cape Town and Durban and all these cities across uh, South Africa, Muslims, they need to take note that you need to be trustworthy traders. So how did the Gujarati people even ex adopt Islam? It was by the Yemeni traders en mm. entering India and being honest traders. So Islam is a deen of mu'amalat, de dealings also. Mm -hmm. And dealings involve because people complain about all this crime in South Africa, if you had distribution of zakat, uh, fair distribution of zakat, and the essential need to feed everyone, there's, there is so much wealth in South Africa that you can provide meals for people daily. And that is what the Sufis traditionally done when they went to different places of the world. They fed the people. And of course, you do have Muslims within South Africa who have those programs as well. Yes. But there is that as as aspect of Islam, and then there is the the punishments, hudud. You have the implementation of these two things. The crime will decrease. Yes. So Islam is a deen of muamalat. Yes. A, a deen of dealing, and a deen of. Uh, of ibadat, both of these. Yes. Many people they think that it, uh, Islam is all about performing salah five times a day, going to the Jummah, fasting during the month of Ramadan, going on Hajj, you know, once in your lifetime, and, and, and uh, you know, the zakat. But they see zakat as a, like a charity, you know, something that, you know, they just work out on the calculator or an Excel spreadsheet and take it from there and then just give it to whoever they feel they want to give it to. But they are completely oblivious of the 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 muamalat that you've um, uh, made mention of. Um, I mean, so so much of the deen is in fact uh, deeply uh, political and con uh, you know covers all almost every single aspect and facet of life, including trade, 
you know how we how how we trade and uh, um, how we engage with people the um, uh, non permissibility of riba. So what we find is that globally Muslims live their lives. They think it's fine to to go to work, um, work wherever, uh, come home and then you know catch up their prayers or perform their prayers fast during the month of Ramadan. But they continue with uh, all sorts of, um, I'd say, instruments that enables riba and, so the, and just con- the, the align the, the system. The collection of zakatul amwal is uh, in fact commanded to the leader, that the leader should be the one who collects. So the government needs to take the zakatul amwal and distribute the zakat. So that's an obligation on the government, that the government should collect the amwal and distribute the zakatul amwal amongst the poor. They store that in the Baytul Mal. They have less than one year to redistribute the wealth. The, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu, whenever the Baytul Mal was emptied, he would sweep up the Baytul Mal and then he would pray two raka'ah, raka'atayn of nawafil, in thankfulness to Allah for uh, permitting him to have emptied out the uh, Baytul Amwal to, to distribute that wealth. So the, the purpose of the Zakatul Amwal is to remove poverty and these are solutions for not only people in South Africa, for all the Muslims across the world, especially in the Middle East, to restore the caliphate and mm-hmm. to restore this, the Islamic governance, the organic Islamic governance with in, open borders. In the absence of, uh, let's say, us in South Africa, we have a non-Muslim government um, who then uh, ensures that the zakat is taken. A lot of people use the word given, but uh, if you could mention the word taken, versus uh, given and also who would that authority then be in the absence of let's say an Islamic uh, So in the absence of uh, uh, a government uh, firstly we we call upon the South African government to look into Islam and people who are part uh, firstly I would like to also mention uh, congratulate the South African government as well because uh, internationally you now have a very good image meaning well as a Muslim in Britain, we, not only myself, I speak for many, that we were very impressed with the South African uh, case that South Africa was at the forefront of taking Israel to the ICJ. And uh, South Africa must be congratulated for that. And we were impressed with the performance of the barristers, the South African barristers, very impressive. And so South Africa is one of those countries which is viewed in a, in a positive light internationally. Yes. So it's open to Islam and that you find that wherever you find black people, mm. as black Africans, uh, black people in general are more tolerant towards religion than other peoples. I find that from my experience. So there is a call to the African people as well to that Islam is your natural religion. Islam is your deen. Yes. And you adopt it and it will stop the exploitation of black people. Mm-hmm. Islam is the only deen that will stop any exploitation that occurs uh, against black people. Oh, no. it's, it's their natural deen and uh, they lead the way, meaning if they adopt Islam, they lead the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Islamic governance is more suitable for Africa and for black Africans to lead the way. So that's first with regard to to the South African government and other governments within Africa. Secondly, with the Muslims uh, who are not led by government, they must elect an Amir openly in the masjid. And then that Amir, he takes the zakat and he distributes the zakat locally amongst the poor recipients of the zakat. That's the eight recipients that are mentioned in Surah Tutoba. Local distribution. Yeah, local distribution. You start with local distribution, especially here in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So we have, uh, driving up to here, we saw areas that are li- um, housed by Muslims. So imagine uh, you have an emir, mm-hmm. and the emir, he takes the zakat and he redistributes it locally amongst the local people. It yes. will have very good effect yes. in uh, locally within South Africa. 